FEBA Commissioner from 2012 to 2020. She's the chair of the CBOC Development and Education Committee, responsible for an awful lot of the good work that's going on in the background. She is a retired FIBA referee from 1999 to 2011, worked three world championships. She's a national evaluator, worked on the CIS U Sports panels, both men and women, from 1994 to 2012, and has worked five uh, CIS national championships, CCA women and men's national championships. Her, uh, her partner in presentation today, uh, Artivan, uh, is a basketball referee, has been officiating at various levels for 15 years, including the elementary, high school, college, university, OSBA championships, MBL, and international wheelchair basketball. But Artivan comes to us today with the uh, title of doctor. He's the founder and director of education consulting, offering equity, diversity, and inclusion training to organizations. He's currently an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Wilfrid Laurier University, an instructor in the Master of Teaching and Bachelor of Education program at the University of Toronto. He's the author of uh, some papers and some books and is currently running his own webinar series in which I think there's been two so far, uh, Artivan being Muslim in basketball in Canada and being black in basketball in Canada, both of which have been fantastic and contain some wonderful material. And I certainly uh, encourage everybody to uh, get on board with what Artivan is doing. Uh, Nadine Artivan, uh, thrilled to have you here today. And uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And it's, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks for the, the, the lovely uh, introduction. Um, and thank you uh, to the 168 participants who have joined us today. I, I am super excited to share this space with you today as um, a Black female official um, who has had to navigate this, I guess what you would call middle-aged cis white male dominated avocation for about the past 30 years. Um, I can tell you that I've been waiting years to have these discussions with my fellow refer referee colleagues. And I guess our hope um, today, and you know, Artivan will add to this, um, is to plant a seed in your mind's eye as to how we as a group here in Canada can work towards a culture shift in the Canadian officiating scene. Um, how we can advocate for more diversity, uh, equity, and a more inclusive environment within officiating in uh, the regional, provincial, national, and also international level. Um, and so it begins with Frank, honest and difficult conversations like we hope to have today to raise some awareness and some understanding of our, our own unconscious bias or implicit bias and, the, and those hidden attitudes based on our social stereotypes that everyone has, even us <laughs> on this call. So, um, so that's, that's what I hope that we can start this conversation and can keep it going. And so I want to, um, to allow Artivan to, uh, to introduce himself and um, I'm looking forward to working with him and you guys today. Yeah, and I think I'll just echo Nadine. I think the goal today is to kind of get you thinking about some things differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, um, many of us have been officiating, you know, self-identifying myself as Muslim, having facial hair. I think we want to discuss um, different ways you can look at some of the practices at your local board, provincial and national uh, boards and think about how can you not just make it diverse. I think the, the inclusive piece is more because many people leave um, sports, uh, playing sports because it's no longer fun. And I think a lot of people also leave officiating because it's no longer fun and they have certain negative experiences, whether it's from the fans, um, the parents, the coaches or fellow uh, referees and so for us to think about how can we make the culture um, more inclusive and better for everybody involved in the game and I think these two pictures why we selected them is um, on the right is Bert Smith when he collapsed in the elite eight and if I had to summarize like 
what our whole session is about. It's uh, it's not about us as officials. It's about uh, the game, and it's and and the game is bigger than us. And I think um, this is how we will make the game better. If you always remember the big picture, the humanity, right? It's not just when I'm playing a game. Uh, it intersects with other aspects of life. Um, so before we uh, begin officially, we like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we want to. You know, I know we're in a remote conference and we're tuning in from different places in the world and the country, but we felt this is important. So we'd like to acknowledge the sacred land has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is a territory of the Uran Wendat and the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Uh, is this today the meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across the Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this territory, and this is specifically for Ontario. Um, so to give you some examples of perhaps how equity, diversity, inclusion, EDI for short, intersects with sports. Uh, gave you some, uh, the top two are really, we'll share these links later for the sake of time. We don't have time, but if you haven't heard of these, please look them up to read more because it really starts seeing why equity, diversity, and inclusion are so important when we're talking about the culture of sports, right? And with officiating, you know, we had the, the incident with referee Bill Kennedy following a slur by Rajan Rondo, where he came out and officially announced he's gay. We had Chris Paul criticize Lauren Holcomb Sterling, calling her judgments ridiculous and questioning her career choice. And as you know, Lauren is going to be speaking later on today. So um, that's really incidents with officials. And of course, on a larger level, we have the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, what happened with uh, President Asai Majiri when the Raptors won their championship and he wasn't being allowed on the court. So um, these examples, you know, and most recently, I think uh, not just with race and sexuality, but we look at gender difference in men's and women's weight rooms in the NCAA bubble, right? So all these issues, they're important and matter if we're talking about how to make sports inclusive from different aspects. You know, these, these talking about these, um, social issues um, is going to make us all feel quite uncomfortable and angry. Oftentimes we keep things in and, you know, and this is a time where we need to share. So at any time during this presentation, you start to feel uncomfortable, um, feelings of anger, um, frustration. Uh, take a moment to reflect on sort of what contributed to these reactions. And you know what perspectives, values, ideologies are those reactions rooted in for yourself? Because this is this is you know a lot of self-reflection. It's not pointing fingers, and that's not what this presentation is about. Pointing fingers at anybody uh, or laying blame anywhere. It's about how can we all make a difference. So um, and so the slogan here that uh, we've included is is you know get comfortable with being uncomfortable and you, you know progress or change doesn't happen unless we can have these uncomfortable types of conversation um a, a quote down here from bell hooks with respect to you know this is part of the challenge and emotional spiritual labor of unlearning unlearning those um stereotypes and those ways of being and, and those uh, habitual, um, you know, uh, remarks um, towards being more equitable, diverse and inclusive. So, you know, what words, and we want you to type this into the chat box, what words or images come to your mind when you hear the term official or referee? And what we're talking about here is, it's about your identity. We all, each individual, we all have our own identities. And some of those identities can be chosen for you, you know, um, or chosen and put upon you by others, or you can choose uh, your own identity. And when you think about that, you know, when you think about teachers, family, peers, you know, teachers um, putting uh, 
sort of stereotypical um, notions of, say, I could I could speak for my own family, um, you know, not smart enough um, because they're black or be you know wanting to put them in a special class. I don't know if you're in the, a family. I'm a middle child. There is things attached to middle children, um, and and those create your identities. But also, you can choose your own identity. Um, thanks for putting those those notions in the chat room there. And you know, for me, uh, you know, my identity would be somebody who works hard every day, um, somebody who's committed and loyal uh, to my spouse, my family, friends. Um, and someone who's committed to exercising every day. So that would be my identity. And so you can choose your own. And so we have um, some really good um, images and words here in the chat box with respect to, to you know, various identities when you think about, or images when you think about officials like arbiter, leader, uh, facilitator, um, somebody who's rooted in fairness, uh, hardworking, courageous, impartial, that's excellent. So those are great. But those, these are images and words that are coming from other referees, you know? And um, we all share this avocation, but what about those that are put upon us? Right from the from the fans and players and coaches. Yeah, and I think I would add to that. Um, mm -hmm. When you think and visualize the word referee, like you just probably thought about it when you decided what words come to your mind. I want you to think about um, what did you visualize? Did you visualize mm -hmm. a male, a female, a white person, a racialized person? Uh, how did their hair look like? How were they mm -hmm. dressing? And that's going to start getting you thinking about how you've been influenced by these different stakeholders to have a specific image of a referee. And, and think about what you didn't think of, because that also speaks about what is included and what is excluded, which I think takes us to the next point around definitions. Um, and I think this slide is the bulk of the core of our workshop today is, um, think about the difference between equality and equity. So mm -hmm. equality is when we treat everybody the same. Equity is when we treat everybody fair but fairness relative to a need. So in this case, we're using the example of you know, seeing the baseball game, right? So in the picture on the left, everybody's getting a box, but we don't have equality of outcome, all right? Uh, we want to have equality of outcome. So that means the process actually has to be tailored. And uh, it's sometimes hard because referee culture is all about standardization, which, does, which makes things simpler, but it also doesn't necessarily leave as much room to insert equity. So that's something I think we have to think about is what are some new ways we can do that? And we need data to prove that. And I think um, leaving here, many of you are in leadership positions in your boards, locally, provincially, nationally, think about how can you collect data to be equitable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I use the analogy of a map. If you don't know where you are on the map and you need data in real life to know where you are on the map, the map can't help you, right? You need to know where you're at. Where do you stand relative to the big picture? And I think um, that's important. And to give you an example of this is um, to kind of bring the theory to life. When you go to park at a mall and there is parking spots dedicated for people with disabilities, you don't complain about that because it's being equitable relative to a need, okay? But if we went to a tournament and uh, there's two equally great candidates, in terms of skill sets and call selection, everything equal, but we, we would put the female referee or the racialized person in the finals, people will now get upset about that. So that's something to think about. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, once again, I think when you leave here, think about why that makes you uncomfortable and what it means to be equitable and officiating and coaching in sports on a large scale. Um, and Nadine, go ahead. That's great, thank you. Move to the next one. All right, so there, you know, there are barriers to inclusion, and there is a system of oppression uh, that produces social, physical, and physical barriers based on sort of these identified issues: ageism, racism, religion. You could go on. 
um, there's sort of an interlocking, you know, system that operates on many levels, right? Uh, these systemic barriers can operate on a personal level. And that's sort of when you look at your own values, your beliefs and your feelings, right? Um, or about people who are different from us or ourselves. Then, then there's an interpersonal level, which focuses on our actions, our behaviors and language. Um, institutional level, like we have in refereeing, we have rules, policies, practices and procedures uh, that are written or unwritten within the institution. And, and that defines who is welcome, who can fully participate, or maybe those who are discriminated against or excluded. And then there's a cultural level. It's sort of how we as human beings define what is right, what's normal, what's the truth, what's beautiful. That's the cultural level. And, and that's often, we often see that through media or through our textbooks that defines what's what, right? Um, and so if you look at, you know, we often hear a lot of this as officials from the fans, from coaches, players, even other refs um, fall into this. And, you know, I, I'd want to bring forward something that's happened recently within Canada is an example of Ethan Bear. As, you know, when we look at the cultural level, Ethan Bear, for those who don't know, is an NHL defenseman with the uh, Edmonton Oilers. Uh, who's from uh, the Ochapawas uh, First Nations. And in the social media, he was barraged with racist messages and comments after Edmonton lost um, and were out of the playoffs. Like that is something that's happening on a daily basis. You know, this has happened within the NHL and they have a platform to which to be able to address this right away. But what about those of us who don't have that platform and, you know, have to continue to deal with this? So something to really think about is it, it happens all the time and we're constantly working at trying to, to move through this. Right, so we're going to kind of focus a little bit specifically um, on the race aspect. Of course, um, there's a term called intersectionality, um, which um, I'll go to this slide first. You are the sum of your parts. So your race, your gender, your sexuality, your level of education, where you live, whether you owe your property, whether you rent, right? Um, whether you're an immigrant, whether you know the official language of the country, all these aspects of your identity either help you and give you privilege, right? If you give, if you have access to privilege, it gives you access to power and opportunities. Or um, if you uh, are in the minoritized group relative to those categories, you are oppressed and you are kind of excluded in some ways and are not given access to an opportunity, right? So I think the we're getting really good as organizations, kind of. Um, gathering data about gender. I think FIBA, of course, is pushing um, to make those numbers more equivalent, but I don't think we're as comfortable talking about the other axes of difference, particularly race, mm -hmm. sexuality, and religion, right? If we can tag every call in a tournament, we should be able to start collecting data around demographics. And of course, it's always going to be optional whether people want to share because it's personal in nature, but does your local board know the makeup of your demographics, if I was to come and ask you or someone was coming to ask you, right? We should be proactively looking to collect that data because as I said, we can't be equitable unless we have the data which will help us identify the needs, which then will allow us to come up with action plans. So when it comes to race, whiteness is uh, not as a race, as a skin color, we're talking about white privilege as a system, right? Certain way of being, right? Certain way of dressing, certain way of talking, mm -hmm. all these things intersect with the type of white privilege that um, gives people access to opportunities, right? So think about it. If you go to a tournament, right? What do we tell you in terms of how you should behave? Who gets moved up? How many people are there? How do they look like? So 
what we want to deconstruct and get you thinking about is whiteness is like the air you breathe. It's almost invisible. And for most people who are in position of power, and that intersects with, with gender, right? So if you're white and male, maybe you don't think about these as much as some other people who are impacted by it. It's the norm, so it's the baseline standard. Uh, I want to encourage you to check out a great short article by Peggy McIntosh, who said, as, and she's a white scholar, I did not see myself as a racist because I was taught to see racism only in individual acts of meanness by members of my group, never in invisible systems conferring unsought racial dominance on my group from birth. So think of whiteness as what gives you access to opportunities. You know, most people, if you tell them you're racist, they're going to be like, no, I have black friends. So they actually make it about the individual act, but we're talking about racism on a systemic level. Like who is in our justice system? Who's in our jails? Who's dropping out of schools? Who can't get access to a vaccine? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about systemic issues. And we thought uh, it's a great way to show you a short video. It's only two minutes by John Amici, um, who is a psychologist, ex-basketball player and openly gay. So um, we're gonna share that with you now and then we'll continue. Discussions. Uh, you have to stop sharing and come back into video mode. Right here we go. You've been engaged in a global conversation about race and racism. You've probably had discussions at home, at school, or at work, and in those conversations, you've probably heard the term white privilege. You may have even had this term used in a way that felt like an insult or an accusation. Others will have told you that it's all just made up to make white people feel bad and none of this is right. Privilege is a hard concept for people to understand because normally when we talk of privilege we imagine immediate unearned riches and tangible benefits for anyone who has it. But white privilege and indeed all privilege, is actually more about the absence of inconvenience, the absence of an impediment or challenge. And as such, when you have it, you really don't notice it. But when it's absent, it affects everything you do. There are lots of types of privilege out there. The privilege of being born into a wealthy family versus a poor family is kind of obvious. But then there's the privilege of being able-bodied versus having or acquiring a disability that most of us take for granted. I have two very close friends who are wheelchair users, and I'll be honest, when I first met them, I was completely ignorant about the everyday ways their lives are made harder through no fault of their own. Some of these ways are simply thoughtless, but some of them are just the way we live, just the way we build infrastructure, just the way everything works that just makes their life harder than mine. That's just one of the ways that I'm privileged. And understanding that, embracing that, doesn't make me a bad person. But ignoring it raises the chance that my friends will be excluded in ways that are not obvious to me. And as their friend, I can't allow that. There's a good chance, as a white person watching this, your life is already hard. Every day you have to overcome some difficulty or challenge just to get by, but you can still have white privilege. White privilege doesn't mean you haven't worked hard or you don't deserve the success you've had. It doesn't mean that your life isn't hard or that you've never suffered. It simply means that your skin color has not been the cause of your hardship or suffering. There is nothing but a benefit to understanding our own privileges, white and otherwise. It brings us closer to those who are different it helps us be vigilant about the ways we treat others different than us. It helps us make a society that is fairer and more equal. Having white privilege doesn't make your life easy, but understanding it can help you realize why some people's lives are harder than they should be. One second to reshare our slides. It's good to have a minute or two just to pause and to think about what John had to say. And just to add to that, John was an NBA player, the first out NBA player. All right. Just want to, before we sort of dive into uh, some discussion around this topic. Just want to give you a few uh, terms um, and 
sort of definitions of what these terms are. And so you probably hear all the time in the news uh, articles, DEI. What is DEI? Well, D stands for diversity. And you know, when you look at diversity, it's the, the ways in which people differ, right? Race, ethnicity, age, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, education, just like the wheel that that Art of, Art of Anne showed you. It also includes diversity of thoughts, right? Ideas, values, and perspectives. So that's something to think about. And then inclusion. It's about, you know, um, creating an environment where people feel welcome and safe and protected at all times. Right for um, diversity and equity to be prioritized as foundations of those spaces. And where people feel valued and respected for their identity and contributions. So that's what we're working towards. You know, we have a membership in the CBOC of over 4,500 people. How can we invite 4,500 people plus into the tent and make them feel valued and respected um, so that you know our, our group can grow and be stronger. And then there's microaggressions, which as you can see, uh, talks about subtle slights, snubs, insults, put downs that are whether they're intentional or unintentional that communicate sort of hostility and derogatory and negative messages. And just to, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, just to end on, you know, incidents that happen on a daily basis. Yeah, and just uh, before we go to the next slide, I think the main difference that I wanna point out, diversity is about um, getting people there. So whether if we're talking mm -hmm. about officiating, I mean, ensuring that your boards are diverse, represent the community of the people you serve. Inclusion is about keeping them there because mm -hmm. you can be diverse, but I can come and go, right? If, I, mm -hmm. if I'm treated with constant microaggressions. So inclusion is, do I feel valued for who I am? And am I respected for my contribution? If you tell me, you know, you, should, you gotta cut your dress, you gotta cut your beard, you should dress and wear a suit and a tie all the time, then I'm like, well, that's not really me and who I am. So at some point I have to start saying, do I want to compromise to fit in or, or do I not, is it not worth it? And I think that's something we all have to think about. We don't have all the answers, but I think the goal is when we leave here, we think about how do we, what do we need to do to change this culture? Because I can tell you through the other series, there is a lot of negative experiences and mm -hmm. a lot of times it gets dismissed and that's a microaggression. Oh, he's just complaining. He's pulling the race card, the gender card, the religion card. That itself is a form of microaggression if you dismiss other people's lived experiences because they know how they feel. And trust me, those negative experiences stick with us and they impact us. And so um, please, when somebody shares something with you that's vulnerable, if you dismiss it, that itself discourages that person from sharing. So think about that. Excellent. All right, well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna pivot here. We were going to uh, send everybody to breakout rooms for about 10 minutes to have- a Sorry, Nadine, now we're not able to do breakout rooms. So we're gonna yes. actually do a moment of reflection on the call, but it'll be quiet. Yeah, that's right. So there's our pivot. So what we want you to do is, um, uh, you can skip point number one, um, or you can actually, what we want you to do is to write into the chat box uh, your reflection. So if you want to share with us um, your answers to these questions, please write them into the chat box. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect this information. And we'd like to, at the end of this, create an infographic that summarizes your comment so that, and, and hopefully post it on game plan or put in the whistle blast so that everybody is aware of and, and keeping it in your mind's eye, like I said, about you know, where we're at and where we need to go. 
and some of those experiences that we have we have all lived. So if you can take an opportunity, take, we're going to give you 10 minutes and we want you to do this work. And since we can't do it in the breakout rooms, we want you to do it over in the chat box uh, to answer these three bullets. And we're going to be quiet on purpose because we actually want to self-reflect. And if that makes you uncomfortable, that's okay because it's a moment of reflection. So it's going to be quiet on the air to allow you to reflect. Um, please put what you feel comfortable with. I know there's people you don't know on this call, but you're also going to have the option of at the end emailing this information to us if you don't want to share it in a large setting because sometimes the smaller setting, people are more forthcoming. So you do have both options. So please share to the extent you are comfortable in this setting, but there'll be an opportunity to share further and expand on your experiences. So maybe I'll go with my clock. It's 1130. We'll go maybe eight minutes. That way we'll wrap up and uh, have a time for some Q&A. Art of Van, the black box is over the third bullet. Great. About four more minutes, just as a heads up, four more minutes.
All right, if you can wrap up your last comments, we have about 30 to 40 seconds left before uh, we'll try to debrief. And thanks to everyone who's sharing and typing into the chat. Um, so about 30 seconds to type your thoughts and put it into the chat. All right, so we'll keep the presentation moving along, but you could, of course, continue to have your questions and comments and sharings um, um, into the chat. I think um, to kind of bring it full circles, um, challenging your own beliefs and biases is a lifelong process. Change starts with all of us doing some reflection and asking ourselves, how are we part of the problem and how are we part of the solution? And it's not a binary. You're not always part of problem and you're not always part of solution. We're sometimes in both categories simultaneously, right? Um, so it starts with us doing some work, but the goal is to change the system. If we only stop at having conversations about unconscious bias and implicit bias, it never really talks about systemic and white privilege uh, on an institutional level. And I think that's what we're talking about. If we're trying to change the culture of sports and officiating, um, and some of the negative things affiliated with it, we need systemic change. So just because you have one Asian, one black person, that's not enough, right? That's called being performative. It's a checklist approach to doing diversity is how do you change the system so people have access to opportunities? Um, diversity is valued and people are valued for exactly who they are, not having to conform to fit into a system to then perhaps maybe, get an opportunity to go to nationals, to get FIBA carded, or to get some other opportunity in your officiating board. So that's something we have to collectively challenge. And the more diversity of opinion, the better it is, because there is no one Black experience, one Muslim experience, one female experience. It's intersectional, but we need to have these brave conversations. And this is how we continue to grow, to become better officials, more effective officials at all levels. Excellent. Well said. Um, before I hit this, I just, I want to thank everybody who's put comments into the chat box. Um, they're fantastic. And I really uh, appreciate you sharing and feeling brave enough to share um, in this space. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite touched. Um, so thank you. Um, looking at, does your organization have an EDNI statement? Um, I, I want to point out that uh, both Artivan and myself are on the Canada Basketball Unified 2020 um, uh, Diversity Council, um, and that Canada Basketball has recently put out a diversity statement. And uh, we've put up the um, URL so that you can access that diversity statement. And you'll notice that it does include officials. Um, but I want to add to that is that, you know, um, the CBOC uh, has also created a statement based on the Canada basketball uh, statement, uh, but it's specific to uh, for officiating. Uh, however, it's it's waiting for approval at the next CBOC executive meeting, which is on June 17th. So as soon as that's approved, we'll we will publish it in the whistleblast and post it on uh, game plan. The other thing I wanted to, to, you know, to make note of is, you know, where do we go from here today? And I, and I want to, I want to highlight something. On Thursday, the CBOC had um, its first AGM, and for those two hundred and something that were on the call, you will have noted that uh, our um, uh, manager of officials development, Mike Thompson. Uh, pledged that equity 
diversity and inclusion is at the forefront of all activities within the CBOC. That is something that, you know, uh, the CBOC and, and we on our committees uh, will continue to make sure that we live by. And, um, and I hope that people will start to see uh, some of the, the changes um, and the growth uh, that has been had over the few past few years. Artivan, you can finish us up here. Yeah, and I think the last point is, you know, sharing these things and uh, being resilient. We know it's not easy. So uh, throughout all this, self-care is important. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an act of healing and thriving. Find yourself a mentor, find yourself a community officials. You can talk about these things and share where you have that level of trust and relationship. Um, these things will help you overcome some of the systemic barriers and challenges you will face throughout your career, both as an official and just as a human being um, with the relationships in your life, right? So there's a resource. I'm not sure if I, I'll try to see if I can share it in the chat. If not, I'll get Rike to send it out um, uh, in the following week. It's called the Self-Care Planner, which gives you suggestions from physically, emotionally, spiritually. What are some ways you can self-care? And I think that's important. And uh, we want to thank you. Um, this is our contact information. If you feel comfortable sharing more about your negative experiences, as I said, if you didn't want to do it in the chat, please, you can email me and Nadine. We talk regularly. We're going to compile it and try to create that infographic. If you're also on Twitter, um, you can add me at Dr. Zadarat and check out uh, my consulting, which has a lot of free resources around equity, diversity, and inclusion in sports and includes a video clip of the recent talks we did around being Black and uh, being Muslim. And our next talk is going to be on Monday, uh, June 28th, about being female in the world of basketball. Nadine, awesome. anything else to conclude? No, I, that's fantastic. I just, you know... I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and Artavan taught me this. I usually talk about a safe space, but um, now I've changed my vocabulary to talk about this as being a brave space. And, and thank you very much for sharing this brave space with us. Um, you know, I'm as part of CBOC, part of FIBA, part of, uh, you know, uh, just, uh, just being a referee. Um, I'm, you know, um, taking on the mantle and the challenge of trying to ensure that all referees feel valued, respected, and um, be, are active participants within the CBOC family. So thank you very much for sharing this time with us. And thanks, Artavan, you're great to work with. Yeah, thank you all, love and respect. And thank you all for taking time out of a Saturday to be here to really invest in your own growth. Dean Artivan, uh, absolutely fabulous. Um, I've had a bunch of personal comments uh, sent, sent to me that are uh, so overwhelmingly positive and uh, uh, tell us how valuable what you've done today is. There are a couple questions in the chat. Um, I, you know, it's very interesting folks when I read some of these questions uh, I, I'm sometimes reluctant to ask them when I read them, but I'm, I'm going to honor the, the questionnaire and, and uh, ask them anyways, uh, Nadine or Artivan. Uh, this almost goes back to the previous presentation from Carl. But the question is, do we see the 25 to 35 selection criteria, which I assume means the period in which you need to first get a FIBA license if you want one, uh, as a conflict with equality and equity? <laughs> yeah well <laughs> good, good, good answer Nadine is my boss still on the call <laughs> oh I I, I think I think I think Carl's Carl has dropped off but but Terry Terry and Terry and I are both on the call so so Hi, we Terry. may be reporting your answer <laughs> well yeah you know when you look at this concept of ageism um yeah you know um, and and we all know as we get older and we mature, we get wiser and we get more efficient when we do things. Um, and, and, you know, you see in other leagues, uh, older officials, but you know what, FIBA, FIBA is their own um, self-governing, you know, <laughs> body and they can do what they choose. Uh, it's our job as, as a national federation in Canada to recognize their rules 
um, and get our officials ready for that. And so that's what I would say with respect to that is, you know, okay, there's rules that are set in place, not by us, but by somebody else. And how can we work within those? But also while working within those, you know, I think something that FIBA's done is they've opened up FIBA um, to allow for more panels, for more participation, so more inclusivity, um, you know, in the past, I'd say year. Um, and so maybe some of those voices will bring about maybe some change. But right now, that is their policy. And so we need to work within that policy, whether we agree on it or not. And I think on my end, if I, I would say um, FIBA should go, I mean, most organizations should go away from the language of should preferred, because I don't know if one day someone decides to take FIBA to court, I think they might have a chance of winning at age discrimination. But if FIBA said, based on preference, we prefer people 25 to 35. Now, I think I heard the most important thing that for the selection of the criteria that was mentioned in the earlier presentation was call accuracy, right? So yeah, you know, in different countries, we have different trajectories. Some people peak late. So yeah, age will be considered 25 to 35, but maybe someone is 40 and is, more, is way fitter than me or other people, right? So I think preference language, which builds it in with the criteria for the job, you know, being younger, likely you are fitter physiologically, right? Um, now it becomes a different case than more black and white of being 25 to 35. But I think this is the conversations and uh, we have to have to see what's the best way to move forward. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm good. I'm going to ask you uh, one more one more question to wrap up your session and try and give everybody about a 10 minute break. The, the, the piece that I'm going to add, and this is for some of the people that are worried about this age piece, is um, let's all please remember we're talking in Canada of about 14 or 15 officials uh, amongst 4,500 or so. And one of the differences is here in Canada, we have the opportunity to work with our officials all the time. So we can support officials that are younger and we can support officials that are older, continuing in their career. We can support officials coming into officiating at any time and work with them to develop them. In the FIBA, in the FIBA mind of a FIBA license, we're talking about somebody trying to get to a world championship. And that does not happen five minutes after you get a FIBA license. It takes years to build to that road. And it's no different than a, a need to, to have a, a career space of 15 to 20 or more years to get people to the top of their game. Mm -hmm. So not suggesting I'm justifying it, but that's part of the rationale. So question. I have seen my female partners experience aggressions by male coaches during a game. How should a partner address the situation while still controlling the game? Should incidents such as these be handled after the fact by the board? Um, how does someone with privilege, uh, I, I think like myself, um, within games in, empower our partners? I guess I should, uh, I'll go as the male perspective and then Nadine, okay. maybe you can go. So I think you have to decide how can you be an ally, mm -hmm. right? How can you show your solidarity? And I think there is no one perfect approach. It's relative to the, the temperature of the game, the scenario. So you can have a hard approach and say, that's unacceptable. Or you might say, hey, coach, would you, I might say, hey, coach, would you say that to me being male? Just to get them thinking, right? Doesn't always have to be like, oh, you're wrong in the hit a moment. Um, so I think during timeouts, hey, how are, you, how are you feeling? Checking in on your partner emotionally because we know emotions impact our call selection. Mm -hmm. And then after the fact, I think, is there a way to collect data, right? Is there a reporting system? Like, is it only, you, you only report incidents when you eject the coach? What if it's a microaggression? So you should, as local boards, we should be creating ways to, for people to report and for a committee to review it. And if there's consistent repeating pattern, once again, now it allows us to say, hey, Maybe we need to have a conversation with this coach um, because we're looking for consistency. 
or maybe they you talk to them and that never happens again. So education awareness, not just as officials, as coaches, and think about all the stuff we deal with as parents, right? So all these things I think is how we can make sports more inclusive. I'll pass it on to Nadine. Well, Artavan, <laughs> I don't think it's just the male perspective that you were sharing there. I think that it's, it was quite holistic with respect to how these incidents should be addressed. Um, I think that, you know, the one thing I would encourage people to do is to speak up. Um, oftentimes, you know, I'm across the floor, I can see the coach talking and pointing and I know what's coming out of the mouth and, and the referee just not saying a thing. You, you need to, you need to address it and deal with it and make sure, and make sure that that coach knows that that's not acceptable behavior and acceptable language. Um, and so it's about speaking up and taking action. Um, I think too, I think, you know, your point about checking in with your partner is, um, is, is very important because you need to have, you're working together as a crew and you need to know that, or you need to express that you have each other's backs um, and that you need to help each other through. Um, in the Ottawa board, we do have a system and, you know, and maybe this is something that the Ottawa board can share with other boards around how it, the, the reporting of, of coach or player indiscretions um, come to the board and then get shared with the school board and go in front of a committee and it's dealt with. Uh, but and we also have our rules and we have tools within the rules to be able to address the situation right away, such as either a technical foul or depending on the egregiousness of the comments, uh, uh, expulsion, right? So, um, so, you know, there are different ways, but you have to be prepared and you also have to be prepared to speak up and to step up. Great. So a um, couple of things. I, I do note that we have one raised hand in the background, but I am going to send people to a break. Um, Rike, a gentleman named Ross has a hand raised in the background. Maybe you can uh, raise, uh, uh, looks like there's two now. Uh, John McFarlane, I think, has up. Maybe they can come in, but I, I apologize, folks. I do want to make sure we get a break in. This has been a great discussion. And uh, Nadine Artavan, um, I really think we're, um, I, I hope we can look at this as a start and we can continue this discussion and expand it. I know there's huge interest and just great reviews from what people have said here. And I think um, you've really given people an awful lot to think about and uh, thank you so very kindly for the presentation. Um, I will tell you if one of our speakers doesn't show up at all today, um, you guys are back on to have the floor for uh, that, that hour and, and fill the gaps. Um, thank you kindly for your commitment to this today. And thank thank you for giving us the space. space. Hey. And I think, hey, and I think, uh, sorry, I see in the chat, I think people weren't able to see others' responses. So, um, sorry, that's just a technological issue. We'll see if we can compile it and mm -hmm. send something out in the, in the next week because um, we're going to have the chat generated. So, sorry if you weren't able to hear others' experiences. We'll look to share that with you uh, in the upcoming weeks. And I have, I have suggested to one of the people that asked about that, that we would try and gather some of this and publish it in a future whistle blast and, and try and have a focus there.